I'm going to welcome Rico and Katie, who are going to talk about um, uh, air monitoring with buckets, which is a pretty, pretty uh, well-established way of doing um, uh, low community air mapping. And I think that's an exciting part of the overlap between environmental justice and open source hardware. And just as a reminder for people who are hanging out, don't forget to fill out the community survey. I will post the link in the hop in uh, chat. Um, and thank you, Rico and Katie. Excited to see what you guys have to update us. Thank you for the introduction, Nadja. Um, <clears throat> as um, as Nadja said, my name is Rico Europido. Um, I'm an environmental health campaigner and I work for a, an NGO in South Africa named Groundwork. We are friends of the earth in South Africa. And I work to support community fence line groups to advocate for clean air. Um, one, such, one such group is, is based in South Durban. You can see from the collage of pictures who live on the fence line um, of two oil refineries and, and all the associated um, industry that, that comes along with, with that uh, sector. Um, today, I'll be presenting with Katie Grodowski, um, and she is a community tech fellow at the uh, Public Lab. And, and, and she'll talk a little bit more about the tool in particular. Now, these fence line community groups that, that we work with are invariably, they are marginalized, they are poor, um, but most importantly, that they are least responsible for the air pollution that affects their health. And also they are most impacted by that air pollution and also least able to do something about it. And the nexus of, of, of that means that we have a, a classic environmental injustice situation. Um, importantly, globally, air pollution is responsible for between six and nine million deaths, according to the World Health um, Organization. So it is a major public health um, um, issue globally, not just for respiratory health, but it's also been associated with many other um, uh, health uh, endpoints, such as heart disease, um, it's closely associated with climate change. So it's something that's, that's really important for all of us. Since the, um, the late 1990s, we have been using community tools to support these community uh, struggles. Um, in, in the picture, you can see one of the campaigners from the South Durban uh, Community Environmental Alliance. And in particular, we use this tool called the Bucket Sampler. And it's important because what it does is it generates community-owned scientific information. Um, and, and we can use that to, to organize, we can use that to challenge air quality governance. And also importantly, the tool allows us to sample for um, air pollutants that aren't routinely sampled by um, governments around the world. This tool was introduced to us by Citizens for a Better Environment, a US group, and over 20 years, it has basically allowed us and given us the space to advocate for air quality standards, um, given the community's agency to develop their campaigns, to challenge big industry um, and government. And it's also uh, an important tool to open up new spaces for dialogue and negotiation. Um, it's, it's fit for purpose. It allowed us to shift the balance of power and to give us a health evidence base to advocate for clean air and, and to mitigate harmful chemicals in the air. And I'll now hand over to Katie and, and pop in and out as we go along. Over to you, Katie. Awesome, thank you, Rico. Um, so uh, as Rico said, my name is Katie Gradowski. I'm a community tech fellow or was community tech fellow at Public Lab, um, which is an organization that works with community groups to use open hardware and community science to address pollution impacts. Um, and we were really, we were interested in, in kind of working with Groundwork and SEDSI on this project because in a lot of ways, the bucket monitor, um, it's really a tool that predates open hardware. Um, the bucket, as Rico mentioned, um, was developed by a group called Communities for a Better Environment. This is one of the original manuals. Um, as you can see, it's a, a, a well-worn and well-loved, well-loved document. Um, and GCM, uh, Global Community Monitor, uh, took this um, to, to over 100 communities around the world. And those communities really shaped its use um, and developed best practices for how to use it, um, adapted it um, to local, as Rico said, fit for purpose need. Um, so this is a tool that was personally important to a lot of folks at Public Lab. It inspired a lot of the work that we've done. 
And when GCM went offline in 2016, there was really a concern that this material would be lost. Um, it's, it's an analog tool. It exists kind of around, around the world um, and is, is very actively used in the communities that are using it. Um, um, but it, it, didn't, it didn't have like an online presence um, in, a, in, a, um, in, a, in a kind of strong way. So the hope for this project was really just to hold space and to work with some of the groups that had or originally piloted it to expand access and to expand reach. So this is, um, I think we, I think Ashley is maybe dropping some links into the chat, hopefully. <laughs> um, and this is, this is, this is kind of the, the project that we've been working on for the past couple of months. So if you uh, go to the public web website, um, you'll see that there are just a range of resources um, associated with the bucket monitor project. Um, and uh, the kind of key piece here um, is this wiki page, um, which is really the heart of the toolkit. Um, and this includes an overview of kind of why the tool, kind of how to get started. We're going to go through some of this stuff. Um, and then also kind of critically ways to interact with this project and engage with it, um, which we can talk about um, kind of further on. So what, what's in this toolkit? Um, what are some of the resources that are here? Um, well, first of all, um, first of all, we just there's a lot of material up here about how, where, and why to use the bucket to test air quality. So this is Bangani Matembu from South Durban Community Environmental Alliance giving a tour of Muir Bank. This is a toxic tour that they do um, kind of on a rolling basis, um, and Muir Bank is a community directly adjacent to the engine refinery. So this will take you past some of the government air monitors. Why would you need a bucket if you have a government air monitor? Well, often those air monitors are offline or non-functioning. They might be in the wrong location. They might not be directly adjacent to the fence line. Um, and critically, communities might not have access to that data. Um, this also takes you through some of the history of South Durban, how Black neighborhoods in South Durban consistently find themselves breathing toxic chemicals from these communities. Um, and it takes you, I think, I think one of the things that's really important in this series in particular is it really shows you where the fence line is. And often the fence line is in residential communities. If you're using this tool, the places where you're going to go to take your sample are also communities where people are living, breathing, and working. So that's some, that's some important context. And then, of course, one of the key things that we've tried to do with this project is to take uh, this guide and update it and sort source parts and materials um, and try to um, make it accessible so that people can build this. Um, so if you go to public lab, um, you'll see uh, this is this is a, a key part of the project. This is a document of an, an extensive build guide. Um, and this is uh, and we've also included you can either uh, source the parts yourself or if you want to get them through public lab, um, we've taken the we've sourced a lot of those parts, so you can you can just do that directly if you want. Um, bucket, it costs about $150 worth of parts to build this project, um, and it takes about, about two hours to build. All total, it's about 10 parts, so it's a very, very simple build. Um, and once you've put it together, um, you can really use it forever. Uh, communities that have this tool have used the same buckets over and over and over again. Um, just to give you a, kind of a quick snapshot of how it works, if you're familiar with kind of the idea of an iron lung, it's basically the same thing. You have a sealed container, you have a pump, you have a Tedler bag in the pump, and that, that Tedler bag will pull air from wherever you are and capture it so that you can send it off to a lab. Uh, and this is powerful because it's, it's, it's literally the air that you're breathing. You get a sample of the air that you're breathing, and you can test it to see what's in the air. Um, and this is uh, in this sampling guide, one of the things that we've done is we've actually just documented what it looks like to go out and take a sample um, and kind of how, what it looks like in practice, what you're going to do, what you're going to think about. Um, again, this is Bungani. Um, this is along Terra Road next to the engine facility, um, actually taking a sample. So why would you, Rico, why would you want to use a bucket instead of a purple air monitor or some other kind of real-time data collection tool? So this is, a, this is a very simple tool. What is it about the bucket that really makes it powerful? Yeah, so that's a good question. So like Casey said earlier, 
what it does is it takes a snapshot, almost like a photograph of the air that you're breathing in at the time. And you can use your senses to, to decide when you do that. So if it smells really, really bad, and most of us know what petrochemicals smell like, you can, you can decide at that moment, I'm going to take a snapshot of the air that I breathe in. And, and that gives you a fact. It tells you exactly what was in the air at that time. And that fact will include all the organic pollutants in the air. Routinely, these air quality uh, monitoring stations only measure for criteria pollutants. Criteria pollutants are defined by the World Health Organization and the governments, and, and, and they're limited to 12 pollutants. A lot of is organic. But importantly, this tool allows you to measure for up to 100 different organic compounds. And many of these organic compounds are known to be carcinogens. So, for instance, in South Durban, people had this anecdotal idea that people are dying from cancer. I know somebody dying from cancer just down the road. And that's what the bucket does. In that particular time, in that snapshot, it tells you exactly what is in the, what is in the air. And then you can go through the list of those chemicals. You can look at the scientific information and, and it will help inform your campaign and it helps um, you advocate for, uh, for, for, uh, for action on those pollutants. Uh, the media, the media love the, uh, the results. You can, you can inspire them to write stories and then you can link them to community stories. Thanks, Katie. Yeah. So once you take your sample, um, part of it is, is building the bucket, learning how to take the sample, learning where to take the sample, um, kind of familiarizing yourself with, with the process of just identifying um, how to do the sampling itself, but a really key portion that we found that uh, a num that communities tended to, uh, it, it's, it's like a, a break point, um, is once you have your sample, what do you do with it? Um, when you take a sample, you have about 72 hours to send it to the lab for testing, which means that you need to have a relationship with the lab set up ahead of time, and you need to know what to ask for. You need to know if you wanna do a targeted screen. Um, if you're checking specifically for benzene or formaldehyde or methylene chloride, you need to know if you want to do a full screen. Do you, if you don't know what you're looking for, you might want to test for all 100 chemicals. Um, and you need to have a general sense, um, in part because testing is expensive and you need to kind of strategize about, okay, well, if I have a limited budget, how am I going to use this tool um, to the best capacity? So we've tried to do some of that work and, and kind of spec out as you're, as you're trying to find a lab, what questions do you ask them? And then finally, and most importantly, um, is this question of what do you do with your bucket data? Um, I think Julieta and Andres, and Andres spoke to this very well. Um, data doesn't speak for itself. It needs people to speak for, us, for it. And in open hardware, we really tend to be very tool centric. We tend to think that the tool will solve the problem, that the data will really speak for itself. Um, and that's simply not true. The bucket is a powerful tool, but it's the people who are using that tool and using that data who will make change. So just very quickly, um, this is an example. We, we've, we've really tried to, in addition to documenting the tools, to try to document some of those stories. Um, this is a case study from Tonawanda, New York. Um, it was actually one of the first criminal cases that was brought under the Clean Air Act. Uh, and it was initiated with bucket samples. Um, there was a group that, there, were, there was a cancer study that was done. They found there were a number of cancer cases and they took the bucket um, and they took some samples and they used those samples to kind of level up on their studies um, and eventually get uh, a full investigation of the factory. And you can see here, you know, we talked about it being fit for purpose. We talked about it being kind of located in communities. Um, and, and that's absolutely true. Um, so this is Denny Larson from Global Community Monitor. Um, this is from 2003. He's literally in someone's basement teaching them how to use the bucket. Um, this is a group of the group of folks that went out to take those initial samples. You know, they went out at two o'clock in the morning to take their samples because that's when they that's when they smelled the chemicals. Um, so it really is a tool that is embedded in communities, um, and it's it's the people who are using that tool who really use it to um, who are really kind of pushing and, and forcing that change. So I'm not exact. I don't know exactly where we are on time, Rico. If we have if we have just a moment, I'd I'd love to just pass it back to you to to say a little bit about how you've used this around the the regulatory and the air quality law in South Africa. Um, I know we're also, I know we, we're, we're 
<laughs> we're, we're a little pressed for time. So I'm going to pass it back to you. Because um, I think that's um, the, the question of, well, what can you do with this? And what are the range of things you can do with this is really, um, is really critical. Thanks, Casey. I'll, I'll wrap up in a minute. So essentially, <laughs> It's an organizing tool. It, it, it allows you to raise awareness among the community yourself. It allows you to build a campaign. It allows you to think about what are the problems in your community and how to rally around those problems. Um, importantly, in South Africa, this tool predated our environmental air quality law. So, so we use this tool to advocate for health to be a central um, element of our air quality act. If, if we hadn't had the tool, you know, that might not have happened. Um, subsequently, we now have um, ambient air quality regulations. We have emission limits to regulate what comes out of the, the, the smokestack. And, and if you had to ask groundwork and organization what allowed us to do that, we would say the bucket monitoring tool was one central pillar of all of that. And, and I think that's a good point to end. Thanks, Casey. Great. Thank you all.